Omaha since World War II, the changing face of the city was made possible with major support from the City of Omaha and the Gilbert M. and Martha H. Hitchcock Foundation with additional support from the Allen and Marcia Bayer Family Charitable Trust, HDR Inc., Weissman Development, and the Architectural Foundation of Nebraska. Omaha moved into the 20th century behind the muscle of big industry. The railroad, meatpacking plants and stockyards drove the city's economy. This was where it all began. The river is there. The place where the ferry landing first was in 1854 is right there. The river and the Omaha Indians gave the city its name. The Omaha Indians were among several native peoples in the territory. The word Omaha means people living upstream or those going against the current. Throughout its history, Omaha has drawn newcomers, people with entrepreneurial ideas, and people simply looking for a better way of life. This city was built on the backs of common people that we call immigrants. It wasn't very long ago, you know, when this city was half, 80 years ago, was half foreign stock. South Omaha rumbled with industry. Where Metro is today, that was where the armor plant was. And where um, United Parcel is, is where the Swift plant was. They had two of the big plants right there on Q Street. That part of South Omaha was made up of working class neighborhood. These are people that worked hard. Many of them were immigrants or descendants of immigrants. North 24th Street was a vibrant, bustling community. But 24th Street, oh, the thought of those, those, those places, the jukeboxes playing. St. Louis Jimmy, well, I've had my fun. I don't get well no more. And you think a great deal of this place we call Omaha. It's very exciting, but we also want to keep it the nation's best kept secret as well, don't we? One thing that I think is distinctive about this city is that it has a home-like and comfortable quality to it. It's readable and understandable. We can read its history, uh, its people, its diversity from elements of the physical environment. Omaha would face a period of challenges as it evolved into a 20th century city. The city struggled to maintain its downtown business district and deal with growth at its outer edges. This is the story of the growth and development of Omaha since World War II. World War II era was one of changes in Omaha as elsewhere. The construction of the Glen L. Martin bomber plant south of Omaha in Bellevue had contributed to the war effort and the local economy. During World War II, job opportunities improved for women and African Americans. By the end of the war, the Martin bomber plant employed a significant number of African Americans. Women had also joined the workforce in large numbers, doing everything from working in the bomber plant to driving streetcars. Just like the rest of the United States, the war effort took many young men away from Omaha. Their war experiences would shape their lives and their hopes for life after the war. After World War II, so many veterans came back home. They wanted to start families. They wanted a normal life away from the horrors of the uh, Asian or the European battlefields. And they had opportunities thanks to government programs such as the GI Bill, home loans for veterans. 
The end of World War II was marked by celebration. There was an atmosphere of tremendous growth and change. Soon the city was bursting at the seams with young GIs and their brides. Housing was hard to find. Young couples often took whatever they could get for their first home. It was an apartment on Davenport Street, right north of Central High. It was a three-story home, large home, that had been converted into apartments. But our apartment was on a street level off of the side and came in a door and there were two rooms. And I said to Lee, where's our bathroom? And he said, oh, we have to share that with another couple. And I said, where is it? And he said, well, it's down the hall. Well, there was a toilet on one side and a tub on the other side of the hall. And I wasn't used to these, these guys, <laughs> but I loved him deeply, so I said, well, we'll try it. It was pretty rugged existence, but we were young and good health and what the heck. <laughs> really, the city goes through a huge transition at that time, as did all American cities. Uh, they had been living in the older cities really for the previous 20 or 25 years. The Depression, the war years kind of stopped a lot of development within communities, within cities. So suddenly after the war, everyone is looking toward making changes. It's a very dynamic period full of excitement and hope. The experiences of military service often exposed those who served to people of other neighborhoods and ethnic heritages. As returning GIs looked for housing, this was one of the factors that helped break down old neighborhood ethnic boundaries. People started to move out of the old neighborhood. They left behind maybe the old ethnic neighborhood and moved on to, to another area. At least that opportunity was there for many groups. This new, open-minded attitude was helpful in breaking down the prejudices that existed among whites. Individual European immigrant groups became more accepting of each other. However, new housing opportunities were not so readily available for many minorities. At the end of World War II, the stage was set for physical changes in the city. Downtown I really did like, okay, well, I guess because I grew up down there. I mean, I, well, kind of grew up. Downtown was just alive. Lots and lots of shops and, uh, and you always took a streetcar home or a, a bus and you didn't have to have cars. Most people didn't have cars, but it was all downtown. Downtown was still the heart of the post-war city, but the push outward had already begun. Early in the century, Omaha had absorbed the communities of South Omaha and Florence, and the suburbs of Benson and Dundee. Down even to the middle of the 20th century, you look at on the map, it's kind of a long, narrow place from north to south. And then what you have in the 50s and afterward is this tremendous westward push. And we have the further development of suburbia. The mass acceptance of the car, coupled with the aspirations of people after World War II, would change the face of the city. The uh, World War II years stabilized the public transportation in Omaha, and so you had many people riding uh, the streetcars and buses, because after all, gasoline was rash and uh, you couldn't buy uh, new automobiles. But then comes the end of World War II, and by 1946, 1947, automobiles are back on the market. People have a new mobility, and the result is a continuing decline in public transportation. The automobile. Everybody could afford an automobile. Uh, the number of motor vehicles in uh, Douglas County between 1945 and 1959 doubled. The car offered Omahans a new independence. This freedom continued to pull people away from the old neighborhoods and the downtown business district. Through the 1950s, my, my formative years, uh, downtown was the place to be. Uh, tremendously active, loaded with people, an exciting, vibrant environment. It's funny that, that people will look back at 
this era in Omaha and say, well, we were really pretty backward then and pretty benighted, and now there are a lot of different opportunities and, and, and the, uh, the, the culture has grown so much. But from an urban perspective, I don't know that that's true. Downtown was wonderful. Ah, there were all the, the, the uh, wonderful stores, Brandeis, Goldstein Chapman's. I mean, there were just a store after Nadelson's. It was just lively. And the, the theaters, there was the Orpheum and the Omaha and the Paramount. Downtown was, in the foggy reaches of my memory, was an extremely exciting place. We're in the Christmas season, or at the end of it, and uh, it's impossible to think about this season without thinking about the eighth floor of the Brandeis Building, um, which was the toy department and the great um, uh, electric train set that was, uh, that was set up and, and the, the color and the, the, the excitement and the kids screaming and all this stuff that was, that was happening. Well, it was uh, an exciting place. We liked to go downtown because I would go practically every Saturday and I'd catch the streetcar. I said from the time I was five years old, I could go downtown and uh, it was fascinating. I'd go to the public library. I could go to Central Market, which was a place where you just got the best of all kind of food. Though we couldn't go to restaurants, we couldn't go into um, any of the uh, 10 cent stores and sit down and eat. You know, we'd have to buy a hot dog and stand up or either go outside, take it outside. Uh, there was that kind of um, dis discrimination that existed then. You had government, you had the medical arts building, and uh, perhaps most dentists and doctors, most uh, uh, medical arts people were downtown. Downtown was a place where all the needs of your life could be met. The post-war city faced challenges as people were able to resume lives without the strains of depression or war. City leaders made efforts to update the city. First, with a Blue Book plan focused on improving the city's infrastructure, from sewers and streets to public parks. Then, with pushes to reform the commission form of government that had been running the city since 1912. Commissioners were elected and decided among themselves who handled what areas of city government. Leaders felt this approach, which combined executive and legislative powers, was outdated and inefficient. You elected your councilman, and then they got together, that was said in a smoky bar room somewhere, back room, and they'd say, well, I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take public works. Well, they didn't call it public works, it was, I'll take streets and highways. And so the guy who had the most clout got that because that was the most money and more room for hanky-panky. Finally, a charter convention was called in the mid-1950s. Its mission was to analyze and recommend options for more effective city government. A.V. Sorensen, a former president of the Omaha Chamber of Commerce, led the convention. As the uh, president of the charter convention, Al Sorensen provided very dynamic leadership. The delegates made a major decision. They would recommend to the voters of Omaha that the existing commission form of government be terminated. The convention recommended that the strong mayor form of government be implemented, replacing the commission form of government. This new government structure created a more business-like model in which departments were headed by professionals trained in their fields. In November of 1956, the people of Omaha voted to accept the proposed new charter. That charter convention, that was a monumental task, and to get it a good one developed and then get it sold to the people because the people voted on it. That was day and night in the difference in city government. In May of 1957, Al Sorensen was elected to the city council and the man who was elected mayor was John Rosenblatt. And Rosenblatt had been the last mayor under the old system. Rosenblatt was a highly popular mayor who had seen the need to have qualified members for the Charter Convention. He had recruited Sorensen to lead it. Many of the Charter Convention participants ran for and were elected to the City Council in the same election. You had a really very high caliber of councilmen in the first council and subsequent councils. So that made a tremendous difference. 
Next, leaders created a program for civic improvements. This was presented to the voters in 1958 as the Omaha Plan. The Omaha Plan was a $64 million proposal that included new headquarters for police and fire departments, a new airport terminal, and an urban renewal program. The Omaha Plan was put to a public vote in 1958. The plan's huge spending program was too much for voters. It was soundly defeated. This looked like a rejection of progress in Omaha. But in the long run, uh, looking down 10 years, most of the uh, proposals were uh, piecemeal approved. South Omaha, which had its beginnings as a town separate from the old Omaha City, was a vibrant neighborhood. It was close-knit. I was thinking of the block that we lived in, and uh, Hispanic family, all oh, then it was Polish, Bohemian, uh, German, they were all, all nationalities. South Omaha was a, a thriving community. The stockyards and meatpacking plants drove South Omaha's economy. Because the agricultural economy was doing quite well in Iowa and Nebraska and the hinterland for the Omaha stockyards, the Omaha stockyards remained really quite strong and in fact was leading the nation in the 1950s as the, the major stockyards in the country. So of course at that time, South Omaha was really booming. 24th Street was active. The area served not only people who lived in South Omaha, but of course all of the farmers who came in, brought their uh, stock to market, and could do their shopping on South 24th Street. So South Omaha always had more of a character of a smaller community onto itself because it had its own business district. We could walk from where we lived, and you could go to the uh, Roseland Theater, I think for 10 cents on Saturday afternoon. That was big, all right, big thing. A neighborhood groceries, a neighborhood pharmacy. Then there was a Harkett House, hamburgers, and uh, that was a splurge. You could get a dozen hamburgers for a dollar. They were normally 10 cents, but if you got a dozen, you got them for, the, for a dollar. My mother worked in Phillips Department Store, drug and liquor department, and she knew everybody, I think, in South Omaha by the time she retired from there. And I think that what is interesting about South Omaha is that that community tends to remake itself. A hundred years ago, immigrants came there from Europe to try to find a job doing something. Maybe didn't speak English, perhaps didn't have skills, but that was a place they could go to get a job without having a lot that they, they could bring to it at that point. This is a place where you can start and, and get a foothold and make your way in America and live. My grandfather, my grandmother, who spoke little or no uh, English, uh, who were hired because of their work ethic. And so, you know, the many people that came from all over the world, including uh, China, Japan, uh, could find work there and be productive and, and make a, a fairly decent living. The operation of the stockyards and the packing industry was big business. Well, first we might look and see what the, the stockyards really were. They're, they're kind of a hotel uh, for livestock. And, uh, you know, farmers bring their, their livestock in and uh, they keep them there while they're sold to packers. And so they're there overnight or you know, a couple of days. But you have a real connection or relationship between the, the stockyards uh, and the packing industry. That when you go back in the history of uh, South Omaha Yards, it was a, a project of local entrepreneurs, which eventually works out to have a relationship with the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, but very quickly, they, they realized that there's not a, enough profit in just having a hotel for uh, livestock. That you want to have a packing facilities located nearby. And so it was a major effort to attract big packing firms to establish in Omaha. But by the end of the 19th century, you have uh, Swift and uh, Cudahy and Armors, all with facilities here in Omaha, plus some other plants as well. The yards and the industry employed a lot of people. Early on, you, you didn't need particular job skill to get a job in the packing industry. 
There were some very skilled positions, such as butchers and so forth, but there was a lot of work there for unskilled people. Local packing house workers were very active in organized unions. Here in Omaha, uh, back in, the, say, the World War I era, you had blacks and uh, white women, as well as white men, most, many of them of European descent, uh, all in the same union. And so uh, in packing in Omaha, as in other major centers, uh, there was a real effort to organize everybody that worked in the industry. The Wilson packing plant reflected the typical structure of packing plants operating in the post-World War II era. You know, they're five, six stories high. And there'll be a ramp at the back of the plant. Every head of livestock that was slaughtered in that plant went up that ramp, you know, up to the fourth or fifth floor. And so the killing floor was elevated. And you just imagine all the slipping and sliding of that livestock going, you know, hogs or sheep or, or cattle going up that ramp, you know, four stories. What you have in a packing plant is a disassembly plant. In fact, there's some suggestion that Henry Ford got the idea of the assembly line for the Model T uh, from the packing industry because you have all this, uh, you know, division of labor and the person just has one particular task to do. My first job was uh, washing beef. And uh, and then I got promoted to uh, what they call knocking, which is hitting this cow in the forehead with about a uh, seven-pound sledge. To be honest, you didn't have time to, to think of what you were doing. I was just thinking of the wages that I, I was making. Um, thankful that I had a job that I probably got because my dad worked there. And uh, in looking back, uh, you know, you, you're almost like a robot. So it was brutal work. It was hot work. It was dangerous work. It really affected me because to this day, I can't even kill a mouse, much less go out and, and hunt animals because of what I did for, for, for so long there uh, that I never, I guess I never had pity or mercy in those days because it was it was survival it was uh, my paycheck that I had to do what I did the stockyards and packing houses also developed their own unique community and folkloric stories 15 18 years ago I was at a, a luncheon uh, it was dealing with a, a labor program and at the table I was seated at were some former or retired packing house workers. One of them started talking about um, the good steaks that they used to prepare in the packing plant. That they'd, they'd swipe a steak and they'd wrap it in aluminum foil and put it up on the heating pipe. And they both agreed that's the best tasting steak uh, they ever had. The packing houses also provided significant job opportunities for African Americans in an era when racial discrimination was common. There was a small community of African Americans in South Omaha, but the majority of blacks settled in the neighborhood of North Omaha. North Omaha had provided initial housing for many newcomers, including Omaha's Jewish residents. Housing was available there. There was a streetcar line on 24th Street that made transportation convenient there as well. And so that led to the beginning of North Omaha as the African American community. And it began to really grow and expand from the teens and into the 1920s when North 24th Street became the main street of, of the black community in Omaha. 24th and Lake was kind of the hub for the black community. That was the pure essence of the African-American thing, and it was wonderful. It was just central to the lives of blacks in Omaha at that time. We had the barber shops, the beauty shops, the restaurants serving the soul food or the food that blacks were associated with. It was economic because we couldn't afford it. I never had heard of filet mignon or anything like that until I went to work at the Paxton and Fondell Hotels as a busboy in my teens. In addition to the packing industry, African Americans found employment opportunities in service industry positions. The railroads always employed blacks. 
in all types of levels, but most of them were either porters, waiters, baggage handlers, or cooks. And they would travel from coast to coast. Being black in Omaha, to a large extent, was like being black anywhere else in America, except that the, the South was more extreme in the racial thing or segregation and all that than northern cities. Unfortunately, and I say this with pain, Omaha was known widely amongst blacks as being one of the less progressive cities for blacks. We grew up in that kind of environment, knowing um, our, quote, our place, so to speak. We just would not be served in restaurants. And, uh, of course, that was a sore spot with us all the time. We, we never really had our great social revolution where blacks just surged ahead. We suffered privations and limitations that are incredible. But I can say that we had very wholesome growing up. Our parents, our friends, and the community organizations made up for that in many ways. Our main thing we had in common was that love for that music. And we felt very special about 24th Street. 24th Street was very renowned because of the Dream and Ballroom. Internationally recognized jazz saxophone player Preston Love began his career in Omaha. The Dreamland Ballroom was located on the second floor of the Jewel Building. The building still stands at 2221 North 24th Street. The Dreamland was renowned not just in Omaha, but around the United States during the Big Band era. Omaha was the dance band center of the world. That sounds like I'm exaggerating, doesn't it? It's ever so true. It's all because of our geography. We were the center of America, almost perfect center. Dances were the thing then. Duke Ellington and Count Basino guys played dances. They didn't play concerts. Omaha was the booking center. We had five major booking agencies here. 214 itinerant, year-round traveling bands with buses, some of them as big as 18 pieces. We had five major black bands. They weren't amateur bands. These guys were name band caliber players. It was on this hometown stage that a young Preston Love auditioned for the Count Basie Band. The Dreamland, to me, is sacred, and I've said it in so many articles. Jimmy Jewell, the late Jimmy Jewell, ran that. And up those steps ascended the greatest black jazz players, blues players, whatever, of history. I saw every major player, and you're standing this close to them, they're right there. Duke sitting at the piano, Basie. These names that have become legends in this day, they all played the Dreamland. Plus, Clubs gave their parties there, the Bull Brummels and the Quacks and the different social clubs and gave their formal dances there. An integral part of the African-American community was the Omaha Star newspaper run by Mildred Brown. The Star often took a more aggressive approach than the Guide, Omaha's other black newspaper. The Omaha Star is one of the most renowned black newspapers in America. It was then, of course. And Mildred Brown, who founded it, is one of the most remarkable persons, certainly one of the most remarkable women, because women were relegated to a second-class station or status in everything in America. She had to start that in Depression years, and to be black and the disadvantages that went with being black is remarkable. And it was a fine newspaper. It dealt with local issues, national issues for blacks, Mildred did all that. Plus, she helped blacks learn how to read by reading the paper. We just assumed everybody could read. Everybody could not read fluently. She gave a sense of pride and ownership to people in North Omaha that didn't even own the Omaha Star. During the 1950s, the city also experienced the power of the Missouri River. National Guardsmen and citizen volunteers joined in a massive sandbagging effort. The boys have been working all night long. Downtown was saved from the biggest flood of the century. The flood provided an additional incentive to continue the Corps of Engineers projects in planning since the 1940s. 
dams and levees continued to be built to control and channel the Missouri River. And ultimately, that would have something to do with us starting to recognize that maybe we can start to pay a little bit more attention to how that river might be part of what Omaha is all about. The Interstate Highway Act of 1956 began the creation of a roadway system that would impact the landscape of many cities, including Omaha. A group of businessmen formed the Omaha Industrial Foundation. This was a private enterprise that encouraged commercial development along Omaha's interstate route, furthering significant growth to the city's southwest. Another significant event for the future of Omaha was the arrival of Alden Oust, as the first city planning director. And in 1956, the new city charter created a separate planning department with a set of mandates for a planning director. The planning director who was chosen was uh, Alden Oust, and Mr. Oust served in that capacity for uh, a quarter century. I think he was enormously influential in, in the city. He was a physical planner, landscape architect, and tended to look at the city from a design perspective. So he put a pretty high primacy on the visual character of the city, on the uh, relationship of its parts. He was very, very much a strong proponent of downtown and ultimately of riverfront development and the connectedness of the riverfront to downtown. Mr. Oust later referred to this early era as a golden age of city planning. We were getting things done. There were a lot of interesting things going on. The city was expanding. We had this good charter. And so uh, they had to listen to the planning department. We, we became a department. We were a, sort of a step sound of the engineering department. The car continued to impact the face of the city. Drive-in theaters and drive-in restaurants neon signs, and shopping malls were all built to cater to car-crazy Americans. The Center at 42nd and Center and the Beverly Hills Plaza at 78th and Dodge both opened in 1955. Countryside Village opened in the late 1950s. All reflected new options for shopping outside of the downtown business district. In 1960, Crossroads opened. And uh, Crossroads was the first regional mall built at 72nd and Dodge, about five miles west of downtown. Crossroads and other projects like it around the country were developed to accommodate the automobile. They had big parking lots. Crossroads didn't kill downtown, but it began that process of change. And that further pulled much of downtown Omaha's residual retail strength outward to the growing suburbs. Industry also began to look at locations outside the downtown area. Western Electric, which made components for the telephone company, basically, seized upon a location out where I-80 turns southwest to Lincoln, out in the vicinity of 120th and L Streets. Their location out there was a major coup for Omaha because this brought in over 5,000 jobs and provided a major new employer out in this southwest corner of the Omaha area. In the post-war era, Omaha had connections with some important aspects of popular culture. Trust Swanson. That's what most folks do. The TV dinner was developed at Swanson Foods' downtown plant in 1953. Omaha's early TV broadcasting era provided the training ground for a young Johnny Carson. Omaha achieved first in rock and roll radio and shopping malls. Two Omaha stations, KOWH and KOIL, pioneered a new radio format. Kids all over the country, what's number one this week? I want to listen to the top 40 so I hear some of the other songs. In terms of the planned shopping center that was automobile oriented, they too evolved in the Middle West, just like the top 40. The first planned automobile oriented shopping center is given credit to Minneapolis, but during the same year, I think even the same month, at 42nd and Center, Omaha had its planned automobile shopping center. Omaha's efforts were acknowledged with the All-American City Award. Soon, a television program with roots in Omaha would also make a lasting impression. Mutual of Omaha was already established as a major employer. The company would soon create a broadcasting icon. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom began airing in 1963. 
Marlins and Jim's TV adventures gave American households a unique connection to Omaha throughout the next decade. Jim and George get in close. Our captives double roped and under control. From the shape of city government and the growth of the city's western boundary to the quest for civil rights, the 1960s were times of change in Omaha. The strong mayor system instituted by the new city charter was tested when Mayor James Dworak's administration was besieged by problems. In the fall of 1964, Dworak was indicted for allegedly having solicited a bribe in an Omaha land zoning case. Dworak maintained his innocence. Even while under indictment, he ran for re-election as mayor. The publicity surrounding the case reached national proportions. The story had negative implications for Omaha's future and its image. A concerned A.V. Sorensen collected enough petition signatures to file as a candidate in the primaries, opposing Dworak. Al Sorensen, um decided to run for mayor in the spring of 1965. What uh, finally brought him uh, back into politics was his realization in 1964 that uh, the city of Omaha, as he put it at one point, was in trouble. And as uh, the wheels literally came off the mayoral buggy in the uh, fall of 1964, and into the spring of 1965, it was obvious that uh, there would um, be uh, a real possibility for political change in Omaha in the forthcoming uh, mayoral election. Dwork's strong support in the Old South Omaha neighborhoods pulled him through the primary. This was a surprise to some, including A.V. Sorensen. However, Sorensen won the final election for mayor's office in May of 1965. Dwork, while acquitted of the charges against him, remained embittered and eventually moved to California. Sorensen's resume was impressive. He had led the efforts to revise the city charter. He had helped secure the Western Electric Plant location southwest of Omaha. And while he was city council president and acting mayor in 1959, Sorensen had successfully championed the creation of the Omaha Airport Authority. Well, his very election and his defeat of Dwork did help to refurbish the city's image and indicate that Omaha was now on a progressive track. With these accomplishments to his credit, Sorensen would face new challenges when he took the mayor's office in 1965. Omaha was a segregated city, not by law, but as a de facto situation, and likewise, um, black residents of the city wanted an end to discrimination in employment. We want the things we feel we deserve and we want them now. We are not asking for something. We feel that uh, there is something that has been denied us that we should have and that we are insistent upon getting, that we get it now. These were two areas that uh, Al Sorensen sought to address when he uh, became mayor. Nonviolent civil rights protests are a part of Omaha's history. Established organizations like the NAACP, the Urban League, and the Omaha Star newspaper were unifying forces in the African American community. Omaha is surprising in, in a couple ways. Uh, first, uh, many people assume since it's in the north that uh, it, you didn't have much racial discrimination here. Yet the historical record uh, is full of examples of it. But here in Omaha, Nebraska, we had quite a bit of civil rights effort uh, beginning uh, at least uh, in the 1940s. One of the things that surprised me was to learn about the, uh, the Poor's Club. The group was founded at Creighton University in the late 1940s by Father John Marcoux and Denny Holland, a student. 
The Nippur's Club was dedicated to changing discriminatory attitudes against African Americans in Omaha. It's a, a local effort. Uh, you had sit-ins and boycotts and, and picketing that met with some real uh, success at times. One prolonged effort involved the Reed Ice Cream Company and their refusal to hire blacks. And the Poor's Club uh, conducted a, a boycott, which also involved uh, picketing, and eventually the Reed Ice Cream Company came around. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, Coca-Cola Bottling Works, which was based in the north side, didn't hire uh, black workers. So Father Marcou and Denny went down North 24th Street, and they got signature after signature after signature. And the unions, and at that time unions were strong, the labor unions were strong, and they took Coca-Cola products out of all of their union halls, and it was really a strong push. And when that, and I know that this is probably uh, old history, but it was, a, it was kind of exciting. Uh, they had they had picketed, and I think the two they finally hired two young black men. In the early 1960s, another organization was also active. The Citizens Coordinating Committee for Civil Liberties was known as the 4CL. The group held marches and sit-ins at City Hall, aimed at fair housing and fair employment. Their primary target was confronting uh, the city the planning department, and the housing authority. They marched, they picket, they held forums, they dialogue with the mayors, councilmen, uh, police chiefs, to try to achieve those goals. In some ways, they were somewhat confrontational. And being confrontational, uh, they appeared to uh, be rather, rather radical, much like Malcolm X would have been. Because at that time, Malcolm X was was a national black spokesperson, and uh, their vision for North Omaha was no different than Malcolm X's vision for people in Chicago or the rest of the country. Equality and justice for all. An Omaha Star headline in 1965 stated, Omaha and Birmingham run neck and neck in housing discrimination. While Mayor A.V. Sorensen worked to promote open occupancy awareness and legislation, attempts to actually change the laws faltered. Sorensen also worked to encourage equal opportunities in employment for blacks. Sorensen told the city that government must set a good example. We cannot and will not tolerate discrimination. This mayor is not going to say, I'm sorry, your skin is black. You're condemned to the ghetto for the rest of your life. Press us and they want us to allow One of the most to be vocal oppressed. advocates for change for black Omahans was Ernie Chambers, problem. seen yeah, here in a documentary in 1966. I can't solve the problem. You guys pull the strings at closed schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. Chambers ran a neighborhood barber shop. He was also the chairman of the complaint committee of the Near Northside Police Community Relations Council. The mid-60s was a time of turbulence in Omaha, a time the city's never seen. And it marked a period in Omaha's history in which lives and families were destroyed, community was ripped apart, such as North Omaha. North Omaha was totally ripped apart. The heart of North Omaha was ripped out in the mid-60s during the riots. Omaha, like other cities, exploded. The race relations problems boiled over in terms of uh, conflicts in the streets, the race riots, as they were referred to at that time, really an uprising in the African-American communities against the, the disenfranchisement in terms of not being able to move out of that neighborhood, not having enough jobs, not having adequate housing. When you look at the difficulties that had occurred in that community, in the North Omaha community over time, it's certainly more understandable as to why the hostilities boiled over in the 1960s. Omaha and Rudy Smith was a youth council president of the NAACP. 
We were trying to break down barriers and stereotypes in other ways. I had still this vision of hope that things could change peacefully without violence. Nobody was able to corral these individuals, to channel them into something uh, helpful, something uh, uh, that could be beneficial to the community, and help them channel their energies into some productive area. And so consequently, they said, well, we have no hope. They didn't see it as hope. And they started rioting, started looting. And sometimes once this frenzy started, it catches on. It's kind of like a wildfire. Smith was one of the first blacks hired by the World Herald. He was working as a photographer during the first riots. I think 66, uh, I was almost killed by uh, several National Guardsmen. Uh, they are frightened. They'd never been in North Omaha. They're trying to protect a burning community. I was dispatched out there uh, by my employer, the World Herald, to cover it. And I encountered, uh, while taking photographs of a burning church, two National Guardsmen who happened to spot me. And they pointed guns to my head, and they were going to march me around the side of the house and shoot me, uh, this church, and shoot me. And, uh, and I guess they would have the right to. Uh, but somehow I got out of the situation. And so uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it was uh, an experience I won't forget. Riots in 1966, 68, and 69 gave testimony to the frustrations of the community. The riot in 68 occurred during and after a controversial appearance by former Alabama Governor George Wallace at the Civic Auditorium in Omaha. In 1969, angry residents took to the streets again after a 14-year-old girl was killed by police officers. People in North Omaha were perceived by people in other parts of the city as that's their community. They're separate, unequal, and therefore they stay where they are. We stay where we are, and neither sh community shall ever get together. And whatever happens over there is theirs. But unfortunately, that's, that wasn't reality. People in North Omaha did work outside the community, and people in West Omaha and other parts had businesses and land and homes rental properties, et cetera, in North Omaha. So everybody had a vested interest in the well-being of North Omaha. The riots and their aftermath had a physical and emotional impact on the once vibrant North Omaha community. When you walk by a gutted block and you route home from school day in and day out, day in and day out. When you go to the playgrounds and you gotta walk by a charred building that hasn't been torn down, that may have been there for three, four, five, or maybe as long as 10 years, still standing, those memories loom large in your mind. And every time you see it, it takes you back. And you remember, and you wanna ask your relatives, what happened if you're young? And many of them won't tell you. You want to ask them, what happened to that building? Why is that block empty? Why does that block look so desolate? Many people don't want to talk about it. And when they grew up, first chance they get, they're getting out of Dodge, and they left Omaha. And they were leaving Omaha by the droves, those that looked for opportunities elsewhere. If they didn't see hope alive in Omaha, A.V. Sorensen was mayor from 1965 to 1969. He worked to develop job and assistance programs for urban youth and to improve the decaying housing of the oldest neighborhoods. Did it go far enough? Did it cover enough of the issues? I don't know. Um, but at least the beginning steps were finally made under his leadership at a time when he was able to enlist some of the corporate leaders to help to begin this reinvestment process into our older neighborhoods and reinvesting into the central city. Landmarks, Inc. was formed to examine alternate uses for the old downtown post office. The group attempted to create an awareness of historic structures and their value for the future. 
However, the ornate Romanesque building was seen by many as a white elephant in these modern times. However, it served its purpose now, and I feel it should be demolished and uh, reverted back into commercial enterprise. They want a new city jail? Turn it into a city jail. Meanwhile, plans for the post office site included the building of a new hotel complex at the intersection of 16th and Dodge and the closing of 16th Street going north. Some saw progress. Some saw the metaphorical closing off of North Omaha from the Central Business District. We fought that and it, of course, involved taking down this post office. Beautiful Gothic kind of post office. And what do we get? Parking garage there. Attached to the hotel, attached to the First National Tower, the press club is up there. So that's fine. That's fine. But what you don't realize, when you cut off access, you isolated part of the economic and social community. Power structure forced us to do that. Forced us to do that. The 1960s saw attempts to create modern structures for Omaha. The new Woodman of the World skyscraper was built on the site of the demolished old city hall. The construction of the Woodman was significant for its height and for the company's decision to remain downtown rather than move west. The money the city received from the site would help fund a new city hall. The entire process began in 1965. The city did not see the completion of the Omaha Douglas Civic Center building until the spring of 1975. In 1962, the ultra-modern Indian Hills Theater brought the widescreen Cinerama experience to Omaha. It was located in the upscale Indian Hills Shopping and Medical Plaza on the developing western edge of the city, near 90th and Dodge. This was certainly a more upscale kind of suburban uh, mall. Indian Hills as a mall, of course, was all enclosed. It wasn't a strip mall. With the retail, with the offices, and with the hospitals, it was kind of a new center of activity that was showing how the city was going to grow in the future by growing west and creating a new center. In the 1960s, people flocked to horse races at Exarban and to summer recreation at Peony Park, two Omaha entertainment institutions. The looping interstate system cut through South Omaha neighborhoods. This move for modernization displaced part of the local community and heritage. It cut through some older neighborhoods down in that area, the old Sheelytown neighborhood, for example, which had been a Polish community uh, back in the 19th century. That was pretty much cut apart as the freeway cut through and made its way towards South Omaha and other neighborhoods as well. I don't know that there's a good answer for how freeways could be built without cutting apart neighborhoods, because to some extent they really did. On the other hand, as we look at them, you know, some years later, you realize that those kinds of transportation improvements had to be made somewhere. I think the average person began to see that uh, we had to have these things to move the traffic because couldn't put any more on Dodge. In 1959, Center Mall developer John Wiebe announced plans for a regional shopping center. West Roads would be located just 30 blocks west of the Crossroads. Brandeis Department Store at the Crossroads did not want competition with the West Roads. Concerned residential neighbors of West Roads also protested the plans. A lengthy legal battle ensued with the Nebraska State Supreme Court ruling in favor of the West Roads. The first businesses opened in 1967. The opening of these mega malls continued to draw shoppers away from downtown Omaha. The 1950s had seen the creation of some of the city's earliest subdivisions. Northwest of 90th and Maple, there was Maple Village, which was important in terms of its size and its design. Loveland and Rockbrook in the southwest represented new upscale housing options. In the 1960s, large housing developments pushed even more dramatically westward. The new suburbs were far west of the old central city, affecting the boundary of the city itself. You tend to forget what Omaha looked like 50 years ago and where Omaha's boundaries were 50 years ago. 
all of this goes back really to the annexation laws in Nebraska and how Omaha was able to grow out from its beginnings in what's now downtown Omaha to uh, encompass surrounding communities and to continue to grow throughout the last half of the 20th century. And really that growth is one of the major stories of Omaha. Cities without controlled growth and proper planning face unique problems. A very progressive annexation law that was created in Nebraska in the early 1900s provided Omaha with a tool to control its boundaries. So when we talk about annexation, it sounds like a, a rather dry public policy sort of thing. But in essence, it was the means that allowed Omaha to grow and to become a major city. If Omaha hadn't continued to annex these suburban developments, uh, we'd have a much smaller city and a city that wouldn't have continued to keep pace with the growth, with the tax base, and with the population that all were very important indicators for the city's fiscal health. City planning director Alden Oust and Mayor A.V. Sorensen understood the potential benefits to Omaha created by annexing new growth. They believe that subdivisions benefited from the jobs and infrastructure the central city provided and should be a part of the city's tax base. I start off with a premise, if we're gonna annex somebody, it ought to be a fair annexation. We shouldn't annex some farm because he's not gonna get any benefit from being in the city and he shouldn't have to pay city taxes. So if we're gonna annex somebody, there ought to be somebody who's in a house or a store or a business that's going to get a benefit, and getting a benefit should share the tax load. Throughout the 1960s, annexation was used as a tool to incorporate the new suburban areas into the city's boundaries by annexing developing subdivisions, or SIDs. Omaha could also annex smaller communities within Douglas County as the city grew. A Sanitary and Improvement District, or SID, enables developers to create a separate taxing jurisdiction. People moving into the subdivision contribute towards the cost of its streets, sewers, and other infrastructure. When an area is annexed, the annexing city absorbs the maintenance and debt costs of any township or SID. Sometimes the level of debt or the inadequate state of the infrastructure itself left the city of Omaha with large costs. And I think that the story of the 1960s that really illustrates the, the annexation battles is probably the efforts to annex first the Western Electric plant out in southwest Omaha, out at 120th and L, and then secondly, in, in conjunction with that, the annexation of Miller. The location of Western Electric, which was such a large facility employing over 5,000, caused this small rural community of Millard to boom and grow. By the mid-1960s, Millard had grown to have over 5,000 people. Now, the progressive annexation law that Omaha had allowed it to expand and annex communities that were under 10,000 population. The heated battle that developed when Omaha proposed annexing the Western Electric Plant and Millard went on for several years. Despite public controversy and prolonged litigation, both were ultimately annexed into the city of Omaha. This progressive annexation approach allowed the central city to remain strong and keep growing. This has given Omaha a significant advantage over cities like St. Louis or Minneapolis. It brought the larger view of, um, maybe I could call it metropolitics, and how Omaha should grow in front of many citizens who otherwise maybe wouldn't have paid much attention to this business of annexation. In the early 1970s, under the Zerinsky administration, the city would put a hold on annexations while it evaluated the costs and benefits. Ultimately, the city resumed annexation with a risk assessment policy. Sometimes forward progress was slow. But in the 1960s, Omaha moved forward with a larger awareness of civil rights issues such as housing and employment. Omahans also had a better understanding of the costs of growth.
The end of the 1960s and the 1970s saw the flowering of counterculture movements and anti-war protests. There was continued activism for equality by various minority groups. This was the era of women's lib and early gay rights groups, as well as pro-environmental ideas and the establishment of Earth Day. It was also the era of Watergate, leisure suits, disco and punk rock. In Omaha, the Municipal University merged with the University of Nebraska system in 1968 with a mission to emphasize studies involving urban America. More traditional college students mixed with bootstrappers, older military professionals continuing their education. And so there was a large presence of that in the early 1970s uh, when I was, was first here. And that kind of surprised me to see so many people with a very military focus. Of course, this was still the Vietnam War era and although I wasn't here, I knew that a number of students from UNO and others had participated in various anti-war rallies that had been held in Memorial Park in the previous years. And the, the juxtaposition of, of sort of that traditional student unrest group with bootstrappers in class led to some very interesting discussions. Peaceful protests were held regarding the Vietnam conflict. Demonstrations were also used to voice student concerns in other areas, such as establishing a black studies program at UNO. This was part of a growing expression of diversity in the city. Sometimes these voices reached the mainstream, as when 1960s community activist Ernie Chambers was elected to the state legislature in 1971. The 1970s was a time of new ideas. Down at the old market at uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, and Howard, in the early 1970s, you saw a lot of the young people, artists and writers and uh, countercultural business entrepreneurs even, who gathered there at the coffee houses, uh, the shops, on the sidewalks, to discuss their dissatisfaction with the mainstream ideas of the early 60s, the 50s and 40s. A haven for artists and others thinking outside the mainstream the old market was developing within one of Omaha's oldest commercial districts. The neighborhood had housed Omaha's fruit and vegetable produce wholesaling market for many decades. In the old market, we had just about every ethnic group possible. Some could speak decent English, most of them had an accent, which was okay. Uh, all of them were dedicated sellers, all of them were hard workers. Some were easy to get along with and some were hotheads. Changes in grocery retailing also marked a shift from the old ways of doing business. The supermarkets had their own warehouses. They were their own wholesalers and they would, they would supply merchandise to their own stores. It was a lot more economical for them to buy on a direct basis than to buy from a wholesaler. Much of the property was, and still is, owned by the Mercer family. New alternative businesses began coming in as the Mercers sought to find other uses for the old buildings. Some people in the city saw this as a, um, a great thing, re reviving the city and thought of other downtowns that had been revived a little bit in different ways. And others found it as kind of uh, subversive, that there was a feeling here, I, I kind of think that people really thought you're not a success unless you have new buildings that are building and your, your progress is, is tearing old stuff, getting rid of the old trash and building brand new things. Well, it was an adventure. We were, we were headed in a direction. We didn't know where we were going, but we knew it was, we were having fun. We were doing something different. We were challenging each other and the community and, and uh, making art. The, the Mercers in beginning to work on the old market did not um, see something that would generate gigantic profits in, in, in the short term. They were very much vision driven. 
It was also, what should I say, uh, a kind of a historical and sociological experience. Because right at the late 60s, we had the Vietnam War going on. And we also had a big movement among the young people. They called the hippies, you know. And, uh, they, and people sympathized with them and so forth. So uh, the beginning of the old market had a lot to do with that. We really did feel that by bringing creative people down there, uh, with the help of the Mercers who made space really cheap for artists and, and uh, writers, musicians, that we would really start something in Omaha. Omaha was, to us anyway, not really recognized for anything very creative. So to be part of establishing a little basis there for a creative community was pretty neat. The old market grew very slowly over a long period of time and was propelled by small investments, by small actions, but, but it, was all, uh, it was all driven in a very incremental way according to the Mercer's vision. Early on, of course, the old market attracted kind of an interesting variety of people. And it did attract young people, people who maybe didn't have a comfortable place to go elsewhere in the city, went to the old market and t started to really create this kind of different and unusual and, and very comfortable atmosphere uh, for people to go to in Omaha. While the old market began quietly and without much fanfare, the rest of the downtown area was facing an evaluation of its future. A study showed a sharp decline in the number of downtown shoppers from the 1950s to the 1960s. City leaders took note and began making plans. Downtown was uh, losing its old uh, multifunction uh, purpose and uh, life uh, uh, and travel patterns uh, in the city were drastically changing in the middle of the 20th century and of course would continue to change. Around 1970, um, a group of municipal leaders um, headed by the mayor, uh, uh, Gene Leahy, and the planning director, Alden Oust, believed that the future for downtown Omaha was to reconnect um, the city center to the river. So here the city suddenly had this block-wide strip of land from way up the north end of the city down to South Omaha. And then somebody said, well, what are we going to do with that? The city uh, invited Lawrence Halperin, uh, a very famous urban designer and landscape architect who, who's still active uh, from San Francisco uh, to facilitate the process of planning for the river. So much of his brilliance involved um, the participation of people in the landscape, seeing people as an active part of an environment, as opposed to seeing the environment as something that you sort of looked at. Halprin and his associates collaborated with local architects. In 1973, they published a document called the Omaha Central Business District Plan. The plan identified two central ideas. The first idea was to connect downtown to the riverfront with a park, which became Central Park Mall, now Gene Leahy Mall. The second idea was to reuse the old industrial area along the riverfront with shops and condos. The plan called this Marina City. Eventually, this area became the Conagra Campus. Um, it's amazing to look back at that plan now uh, 20, 30 years after it was completed and, um, and look at, at, at its realization. Virtually everything that was proposed in that plan has been done in one way or another, some very successfully, some not so successfully. Omaha's leadership looked to a return to the river effort to revitalize downtown. Other parts of the old city of Omaha suffered drastic changes. While Omaha's leaders planned to revitalize the downtown, the stockyards and packing houses, once the largest in the nation, were becoming obsolete. One reason was innovation. As with many industries, a horizontal building was more efficient. It could now accommodate modern industrial activity 
better than the old multi-story warehouses and packing plants could. The main method of industrial transportation within the walls of a building was horizontal. It was the forklift. And, uh, and that became much more efficient. The downside of horizontal organization is that you need big expanses of land. You couldn't put those together in the middle of a city. Um, and so you looked for areas on the edge of the city where you could, you could assemble uh, a, a large acreage. Like the big industrial plants, the packing houses found it more economical to move. The economy of the packing industry was also changing dramatically. Packers began to buy their cattle directly from the producers. The big central selling operation of the stockyards was no longer necessary. The packing houses uh, closed, of course, in the late 60s, but they were in decline during the 1960s, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, they included the conversion of transportation from rail to truck um, that, that made it much easier for producers to just ship directly to uh, packers um, as opposed to coming to a terminal stockyards. The urban packing houses were, uh, were unionized um, and, and were paying high wage scales. Uh, their labor costs were relatively high. There were uh, increasing mandates. Um, for example, people downstream from Omaha didn't particularly like the uh, prospect of solids floating down the Missouri River down, down past their riverfronts, uh, uh, and, and those resulted in federal mandates to, to change. Um, all of these things conspired to make it a lot more economical for packers to locate in uh, production areas and out of the, the urban areas. That brings pressure on the firms that are, are unionized, and by the time we get into the 19 late 70s, early 80s, this industry is, is really in, in turmoil. And so the wage rates have dropped. The great jobs that people once had in, in the industrial sector that allowed them to support their families disappeared. When the, uh, the head of the household no longer made a living wage, the family broke apart. Um, the, 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 the makeup, for example, uh, of, of black and white families in the early 50s was not very different. Uh, the, the percentage of, of um, single parent or female headed households was not very different in the two communities. And obviously by the 1970s that had changed dramatically as well. So we had uh, uh, the opportunity for, uh, you know, your children that grew up thinking, oh, I could become a, a union steward or I could become this and that with a packing house. Although the loss of jobs was devastating, some found a positive side to the plant closings. So many of them, it, it could have been the best thing that, uh, that happened to them because it took them out of a, a, a very uh, difficult job to something more pleasant where they, did, they didn't come home uh, dragging because of the, the rigors of a, of a kill floor. When the change came so swiftly, we were left wondering, what do we do now? Where do we go now? So many people had everything wrapped up in the packing plants. There were families, fathers and sons and cousins that all worked in the packing plants. And now, what's happened? What affects one affects the others. Many people had a lot of talent, uh, physical, mental, that uh, I wouldn't say it was wasted, but it was not utilized in uh, the packing house. And so they found other opportunities and, uh, and, and then began to rejuvenate uh, uh, their, their personal economy. The loss of those jobs had uh, tremendous impacts, um, not just in South Omaha where everybody thought they would be, but also in North Omaha where, where many of, of, of the packing house workers lived. And I don't know that we've recovered from that yet. The changes experienced in the packing industry were part of an overall shift in the U.S. from manufacturing to service industry jobs. In Omaha, many jobs developed as a part of new technology. The Watts line, or 800 phone number, allowed for phone call-in centers that created new opportunities. 
We underestimated how fast it would grow because we had to keep expanding and expanding with more operators. The first 800 number, the trial and error period, was very interesting. The majority of the calls were easily answered uh, by our technicians, and we realized that this 800 number business uh, was going to be something that was going to materialize and materialize quickly. Soon, a new service industry was taking shape with an Omaha base. Wiseman's involvement led to the establishment of the Hyatt Reservation Center in Omaha. You could sell anything on the phone if the people could respond properly and could guarantee to the person on the other side of the phone that they had a valid reservation or that uh, they were covered. Improvements in technology helped the telemarketing business grow. Omaha proved to be an ideal location for many of these companies. We, of course, had realized that Omaha, because of the infrastructure with SAC being here, because of the central time zone, which was extremely important because you would get two extra hours of calling from the West Coast, uh, it'd be 10 out there while it was midnight in Omaha, so you could keep your res centers open to at least midnight to continue to re receive calls. Soon Omaha was home to other pioneering call center businesses. Eventually, Omaha's telemarketing industry employed more workers than the packing industry had. The decade also brought challenges and opportunities. In 1976, the Omaha Public Schools instituted court-ordered busing. In 1979, Ernie Chambers secured new legislation changing the election of city council members from at-large to district. Omaha and Fred Conley would be the first African-American elected to the city council in 1981. In the 1970s, the long controversial process of freeway construction began, cutting through the North Omaha community. How do you prepare for an interstate system to come through and divide a community that for over 60, 70 years was cohesive? It was kind of like a big rupture, like a, a volcano that just kind of erupted and just destroyed the landscape. Two major weather events struck Omaha in 1975. In January, a major blizzard disabled the city for days. On May 6th, a huge tornado tore across the central city, resulting in three deaths and extensive damage. I was very fortunate to not be directly in the path of the tornado. I was at my home. I was, however, able to watch the storm from a distance. And uh, the image of the storm cloud, visions of what was in the sky is what remains in, in my memory at this time. The sky was absolutely green, and it was green before the storm hit. And it became very clear by listening to the radio that this tornado was aimed, again, directly at 72nd Street, and it was going to hit where people really were. It was a very fearful, uh, a very fearful thing to know that this monster storm was going to hit where people were. And I think what was so scary for us at the time was that you just did not expect a monster tornado to come into the heart of the city. Just did not expect it to do that. Uh, there were the inevitable comparisons to the tornado of 1913, which also cut through the heart of the city. And it, it just made everyone feel so vulnerable to know that even in the modern era, when we had warnings and all kinds of other things out there, that uh, you, the city could be brought to its knees, literally, by having a monster storm that went up 72nd Street and destroyed uh, things that, that people really held familiar. Despite challenges the city faced, a 1974 Harper's Magazine study ranked Omaha as 10th in quality among larger places to live in the U.S. When Jean Leahy left office as mayor, he led an effort that continued to work toward the return to the river goals. The whole downtown area was dying. 
at that time, including that area too. It was all pretty run down. There wasn't too much capital being put into anything down there. In 1975 and 76, blocks of businesses began to be cleared for the planned Central Park Mall. I thought things were gonna change real quick and they didn't change real quick. It was quite a struggle to keep the place going and, you know, and waiting for that dream to happen. Businessmen who saw the need for a strong downtown continued to invest in the aging central business district. The old Orpheum Theater was restored. It reopened in 1975 as a performing arts center. The Union Pacific donated the monumental Art Deco Union Station to the city today known as the Durham Western Heritage Museum. Still, many early Omaha landmarks disappeared from the horizon. The original Woodman of the World Building, constructed as one of Omaha's first skyscrapers in the teens, came down in 1977. The distinctive Fontenelle Hotel closed and was ultimately demolished. The return to the river movement, with its roots in the late 1960s, envisioned a riverfront that would feature recreational areas, green spaces, and other attractions. This new vision for the city was a reaction to the economic shift from old blue-collar industries such as packing. The Central Park Mall, largely completed in the early 1980s, had served as the catalyst for 19 new downtown buildings. 24 others had been renovated. Much of the new development came about as a result of public-private partnerships. The dominant business leaders continued to have strategic roles in reshaping the city. Omaha continued its plans to build a new downtown image. In the fall of 1980, Brandeis closed its downtown doors for the last time. In 1984, an attempt to reshape the old downtown retailing sector was made. The 16th Street Pedestrian Mall and Park Fair Shopping Mall were constructed. Park Fair, when it opened in the mid-80s, was a very exciting place. Not, not a very big center, but very, very exciting. It was about 95% occupied. Uh, it had a number of uh, tenants that were generally considered to be national credits. And obviously that momentum changed a, a great deal. But these are problems that, that downtown retailing, or at least downtown general retailing, have experienced in, in all but a handful of cities. Park Fair's role as a shopping mall was short-lived. It isn't that there's no retail market in a downtown district, but that that retail market is different. It is more specialty retailing. Uh, it's more focused on specific niches, and that's why you could have, at the same time, a park fair shopping center focused on general commercial retailing that declined, and an old market area a few blocks away that focused on experience and on specialty retailing prosper, and have those two things happen at exactly the same time. Downtown residential options were also growing beyond just old market lofts to offer more choices. Increasingly, downtown Omaha offered diverse places to work, play, and live. Other parts of the city continued to evolve. After much debate, a system of bike trails was developed that enhanced Omaha's recreation options. Growth and development on the western border of the city continued beyond West Roads. The Regency area, which was platted in the 1960s, continued developing with both residences and a shopping mall. In the late 1980s, One Pacific Place became an early planned mixed-use development. The former horse pasture lands ultimately offered upscale shopping, offices, and apartments. It was obviously a controversial project and it in some ways reflected development rights versus trying to keep land in, particularly high value land in, in, in open space. Um, and, and there was a great deal of opposition to it from people who lived around it who feared its effects either on traffic or on flooding or on development patterns. Um, I think the result is a project that's a very nice one and that probably even people who 
vehemently opposed it for understandable reasons probably use and, and, and think is a, um, is a decent project. Regency is certainly an example of such a project as well. A huge controversy in the 1980s was rooted in the oldest part of the city. Activists for historic preservation and advocates for progress faced off over the fate of Omaha's historic Jobbers Canyon. Jobbers Canyon derived its name from the wholesaling function many of these buildings had served. The event that set the stage for the Jobbers Canyon conflict was actually the merger of Omaha's Internorth with Houston Natural Gas. The new company, renamed Enron, moved to Houston in 1986. Internorth was a homegrown Omaha company with ties going back to the 1930s as Northern Natural Gas. Omahans were faced with the loss of a major corporation during the challenges of an economic downturn and a national farm crisis. As a result, in 1987, the Nebraska legislature passed bills LB-775 and LB-270. This legislation was designed to encourage economic development. Conagra head Mike Harper was one of the business leaders spearheading the new legislation. And I don't want to imply that Harper was uh, doing this for purely altruistic reasons. He was doing, he was, uh, he was making a deal here. He was looking at uh, uh, ConAgra's uh, interests, but what he had was a um, uh, city and civic leaders who were were um, mindful. Okay, we lost a major corporation here. And uh, we do not want to see any more uh, firms leave. And, and so, uh, in a way, uh, uh, Harper um, was um, in a very advantageous position because of the uh, fear that uh, was begotten uh, by the uh, departure of Enron. ConAgra had evolved from an established company, Nebraska Consolidated Mills. Under Harper's leadership, the company went from a loss position to become a major American food processing company. In the late 1980s, Conagra was ready to build a new company headquarters. Civic leaders hoped that the company would build its new headquarters downtown. And here we come into the Jobbers Canyon controversy. Now the circumstances that caused its demise we're all very familiar with. Uh, Conagra's demands of, of how they wanted their campus and what kind of urban context they wanted it in. Uh, Mike Harper, as ConAgra's leader, simply uh, saw, as uh, he put it at one point, a number of ugly red brick buildings. And he felt that these uh, buildings were an eyesore and that they should go. It was a gun to our head. There was really no choice because the decision makers at ConAgra said, this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, the Omaha corporate community and, and civic community at the time really had to go along with it because the bottom line of losing ConAgra would have been very, very serious as well. My belief then and now is that what was at stake here was the historical role of downtown Omaha as a center for the community and that downtown could not lose this major corporate investment and major corporate headquarters and have any possibility of gaining momentum or regaining momentum as a um, civic center for the city. But what we advocate, and many individuals advocated at the time, was let's sit back and, and look at how both these needs can be integrated. To one extreme of, of ConAgra just reusing all those buildings, they could have been made into first class office space easily and much more economically than the suburban campus they have. Uh, but the desires of the owner of ConAgra just wasn't interested in that kind of environment. Marty Schuchert was city planning director at this time. We worked hard with uh, a number of people, including ConAgra, to try to develop a hybrid solution, um, a solution that would incorporate new development with the best of the old development and would, in effect, marry Jobbers Canyon with, uh, with, with new growth. And we thought that that had legs and it didn't. Uh, ultimately, when push came to shove, ConAgra did not accept it and said, 
it has to be a cleared new development site um, or else we'll find another site. And that other site presumably would have been a suburban site on property that the company had bought around Lonergan Lake in northwest Omaha. And see, it's complicated as well that a traditional way of looking at cities was to study, study their architecture. So when you do tear something down, you're, uh, uh, you know, you're taking something away from the history of that city. Losing a million and a half square feet of National Register historic space, 22 buildings, was a major act of uh, cultural vandalism. I'd use a word that strong. There was just no excuse uh, from a rational point of view to do that. They were good buildings, they're in good shape, there was many viable businesses in them, they, they weren't empty. They weren't 100% used, but they're by no means empty. It, it was the only district like that in the country, of that scale, and that magnitude, and that density. We had spent federal money to hire an architect to look at one of the nicest of the Jobbers Canyon buildings, how it could be converted. Well, it could be converted beautifully into apartments. They had plans for typical apartments. They'd done all the financials. They knew it would work. And uh, 10 years had passed. There were no developers in Omaha that had enough foresight to see that that would work. A lot of people don't know the way that capital works. And for years, I'd hear so many people say, they should do this or they should do that. They should do this and they should do that. Well, who is they? Okay, Is it the city? Are they going to risk taxpayers' money renovating a, a bunch of buildings? Well, that's not really the place for you know the city. But that was a mis big mistake, in my opinion, because those warehouses today uh, could become uh, everything at the Old markets now could have theaters, they could have hotels. So it certainly was a shame, given that Conagra wasn't actually using the land. Uh, they just didn't want the view of the buildings. But at the same time, oh God, that would have been so cool if somebody would have taken the risk and put, it would have taken a lot of money. But if, the, if those buildings could have been renovated, that would have been absolutely incredible because that would have definitely been a unique space for the downtown area. But sometimes you have to, you know, you got to take what you got. And ConAgra, it's a wonderful space. For a variety of reasons, ConAgra chose the downtown site. And I think one of those reasons was because the business leadership in Omaha was so taken with the concept of Marina City. The, the old concept that had been developed 15 years earlier, that they really saw this as the vehicle for achieving that dream. Marina City was condominiums and shopping center. That wasn't going to happen. ConAgra was something very different from that, but still the essence of it was the same. The lake, the open space, the relationship to the river, and the buildings around it. I thought it was unfortunate that they tore down Jobbers Canyon. Omaha worries about its image. Well, Omaha got a black mark <laughs> on its image, a pretty big smudge. Uh, by tearing down Jobbers Canyon. So here we are with ConAgra, it's wonderful. Delighted they stayed downtown. Would have been very serious loss for the city and downtown to lose them. We were so afraid of losing another major company. We would have done anything for anybody, and, and that's what we did. And uh, had a tremendous uh, trade-off because of it. The Warehouse Canyon represented really what I thought was the heart of what Omaha had been all about for a hundred years. The wholesaling business was related to the railroad down on the river uh, where, where Omaha started and where the major industries that created Omaha had been for over a hundred years. And to lose those buildings was a, a very real sense of grief for what was gone. I think it just did us a lot of damage. It, you know, it kind of said, well, those folks out in the plains really don't kind of know what they're doing urban design-wise. Omaha has gotten itself to this new stage. And as an historian, I have to take the long view. 
the loss of the Warehouse Canyon was maybe really the end of that old blue collar era city that made Omaha for such a long time. And what the riverfront has become now is really the beginning of what Omaha is going to become. Now, if I last another 30 or 40 years, perhaps I'll be able to see the beginning of that new era. The Conagra campus was completed in 1990. The loss of the Warehouse Canyon was a focal point of change in terms of where Omaha was headed and where the riverfront was headed. Because since that time, the riverfront, in fact, has really taken off. I definitely could see both sides of that. And I feel, you know, for the people that lost the buildings that they really wanted. But I understand that, the, you know, the ConAgra campus is very nice down there. It's a very nice open space. That's another thing you need, I feel, that you need in a, in a, in a city. Downtown area especially is, you know, open space. The ConAgra campus was really a beautiful addition. And that amenity and that investment from, from a big corporation created, I think, a lot of the subsequent housing market that, that has since been so fundamental to, to the growth of downtown. I can't overestimate that, that um, to have two to 3,000 housing units in downtown over a 15-year period is, is a pretty tremendous thing in a city that had virtually none before that effort started. I think that um, successfully realizing the ConAgra project really committed Omaha's considerable private sector to downtown. We are blessed here with having a private sector that makes enormous contributions and, and frankly has enormous resources. When $75 million had to be raised for the Arena Convention Center, um, that was comparatively no big deal in Omaha. Other significant projects in the downtown sector were also happening. The Union Pacific converted its historic 1891 freight house into a state-of-the-art dispatch center, combining history and technology. The Heartland of America Park was completed in 1990 adjacent to the new Conagra campus. In 1991, the Landmark Center building was completed on land between the Central Park Mall and the Old Market. The old Paramount Theater, long vacant, was reopened as the Rose, in honor of benefactor Rose Blumpkin. Another example of the private sector's investment in the community was unveiled in 1996. A proposal was announced for the land from 8th to 17th Streets and from Douglas to I-480. The plans called for the construction of the new First National Bank Tower and the new digital presses of the Omaha World Herald. It would have been far easier for First National Bank to build a lot of its facilities at its office park in West Omaha. Uh, it would have been a lot easier for the World Herald to construct a printing plant in a suburban office or, or industrial park. Um, they actually followed the path of most resistance and highest cost rather than least resistance and lower cost. And they did that because they're enthusiastic about downtown. And I think that enthusiasm in many ways stemmed from uh, the success of getting the ConAgra project done at the riverfront. Other changes in historic Omaha icons included the end of horse racing at Exarbon. Peony Park also closed. The old Exarban racetrack land continues to see development. New facilities already completed include UNO residence halls and UNO's Peter Kiewit Institute. A business campus for First Data Resources has also been built. A very symbolic uh, event came on Saturday, the 21st of August, 1999, when the Peter Kiewit uh, Institute was dedicated. On this very same day, over in the old Union Stockyards, the property of the stockyards was being auctioned in the second day of an auction. So as the stockyards were shutting down, the Peter Kiewit Institute, with its uh, thrust toward the economy of the 21st century, was opening. Other areas of the older city are redeveloping in new ways. People will pick Dundee as a place to live because they've heard about it or because it's got a certain sort of aura about it. And 
frankly, that aura is its walkability, its diversity, um, and its business district. A number of businesses and property owners about 1980 decided to do the little lighting and streetscape project. Now, of course, Dundee's a very fashionable place. Now, the question is, how do we take those lessons and models and apply them both to other business districts around the city and to new areas in the city as well. Dundee doesn't need to be a unique thing. There's nothing that unique theoretically about it. It's a business cluster surrounded by houses. How do we take the lessons that we can learn from that, the relationships of buildings and people and the kind of activity that happens there, even the dimensions of the street, and apply those to new areas? Today, planners and developers are faced with continuing challenges. How does the city apply the most creative options to build new neighborhoods and revitalize older ones? So if our objective is to create a wonderful neighborhood business district in a suburban neighborhood, we can look at the model of Dundee and Countryside Village and do that again. They work. They clearly work. They're, they're clearly uh, renting. There's high occupancy. And it gets into the issue of what kind of an experience are we creating? Because ultimately, the building the experience is what brings people back. It's what makes the difference between a big box store and a business district. And it's the kind of thing that creates spaces that people treasure and stay around in, as opposed to coming, parking their car, doing their business and leaving. It's the difference between, again, a city and an aggregation of developments. And I really think that that's our development challenge for the next century. The area that once housed the stockyards and packing plants continues to be remade. The land that, that had the packing houses on it got converted in the early 1970s to the South Omaha Industrial Park. The old Penns area from 30th to 36th Street is the Stockyards Plaza Shopping Center. The balance of the yards uh, is being converted to the South Omaha Business Park and about uh, a good chunk of that land is spoken for as well. The historic Livestock Exchange Building will be remodeled into over 100 apartments. The ballrooms will be remodeled and commercial businesses will occupy the first two floors. The old South 24th Street has taken on a new vitality with a fresh influx of immigrants. The big push into Omaha today is Hispanics. We've gone from a little over 16,000 Hispanics, according to our estimates in 1990, to 2,000, and now really, so it'll be on 2,000, where we have well over 40,000, maybe 43, 44,000. So South Omaha has changed literally in a decade. But it's a strong community, um, and they're very strong families, strong ties, and actually they have made their mark. I don't think that you can think about Omaha now without its Latino population. They dedicated a monument to uh, South Omaha packing house workers, and the monument uh, is at Stockyards Plaza, a little strip mall uh, down near the, the stockyard. And I wonder what this monument's going to look like, because I wanted it to be an, a nice monument, and it was uh, the result of the, the work of sculptor John Laba. And so you had a lot of people from South Omaha, you know, and this is on L Street, still a Polish community. And so you have a lot of people who worked in the stockyards there. But they had a mariachi band uh, moving around the crowd. And I thought that was a nice touch because you had the old South Omaha in terms of uh, people who were sons and daughters or grandsons and granddaughters of immigrants from Eastern Europe. But you also had uh, the sign of the new immigration in South Omaha with this mariachi band. Plans for continued development in South Omaha call for emphasizing the ethnic restaurants and shops. The goal is to reinforce the neighborhood as a unique destination like the old market and Dundee. Downtown, the new Liberty School also reflects Omaha's evolving and growing diversity. Our lower grades are very Spanish. I mean, um, our kindergartens are probably 75% of the children are Spanish speakers. So we are a, a minority school. Around 20% or a little less would be the Anglo number. Some of those families really are families who have always lived in that neighborhood. And that's, that's really fun for us. We have a, about a 10%, a little bit more, maybe 11% African-American population. 
and the rest of the children are Native American, probably Asian American, so many different faces and um, different languages. We have some children from the Sudan and also from other parts of Africa and who are native French speakers as well. In North Omaha, some redevelopment has taken place. We always have put a, a, a real stress on the need to get more people living in North Omaha. Um, you don't get neighborhood services and other kinds of activity happening unless the rooftops are there, as any suburban developer will tell you. I think that's now starting to make some sort of commercial development more sustainable, and we're beginning to see that. So I think we're beginning to see a re-evolution of North Omaha um, that involves more people, more residences, more services, more jobs um, that, that ultimately can, um, can help to repair a lot of the damage that took place in that neighborhood during the 20th century. You may never have another near north side like you had. I don't think it ever will exist again. We need black businesses all over the city, South Omaha, West Omaha, you know, North Omaha, East Omaha. Black businesses need to be part of every corner of the city to be viable. The opportunities for blacks are better, but they could be improved. There still needs to be change as far as uh, race is concerned and um, cultural diversity in Omaha is needed in, in many uh, areas of the city. Employment, education, housing. We need additional entrepreneurial type ideas. Uh, we need uh, uh, people to be creative, visionary in their venture. Plans were announced in March of 2003 for a jazz, cultural arts, and humanities center named for Omaha jazz musician Preston Love. Other community revitalization plans are in various phases of development. These include ideas to honor the legendary music scene with a park named for the Dreamland Ballroom. Efforts have also been made to recognize prominent Omaha native Malcolm X. In 2003, the city designated Malcolm X Avenue in his honor at 33rd and Bedford, his birthplace site. As part of the Papio watershed flood controls that curbed flooding within residential areas, the city has also created recreational lakes. These lakes have attracted more suburban development. There is no doubt that the city continues to push westward. Some Omahans talk about sprawl and increased commute times. However, though the city continues to move west, significant activity is happening to remake the downtown. Many new housing options are still being created downtown. We, uh, we don't have a downtown shopping center yet. And that's the only thing that I haven't seen occur that I'm sure will occur. In 2003, the Drake Court apartment complex reopened. The buildings were gutted and the interiors were rebuilt. The historic structures now provide contemporary housing. Along with the new Liberty School, the Drake Court brings new life to the 20th and St. Mary's area. This is just one near downtown neighborhood in need of positive changes. The Old Market continues its incremental growth as one of Omaha's most intriguing historic neighborhoods for shopping, dining, and apartments. Well, the Old Market's been a very important, extremely important element that's almost saved downtown. It's, 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 kept, it's kept people's attention on downtown. It's brought all the traffic and visitors. If it hadn't been for the old market, uh, you know, really what, what were you to have done downtown as a, as a resident or a visitor or as an office occupant, it would have been very bleak for 30, 40 years. I don't think there's a, there's a place like it anywhere else in the United States. Uh, the, have someone come here from New York or Chicago and you can uh, impress them with Omaha. Downtown redevelopment is culminating in a massive remaking of the riverfront. The new convention center is flanked by a restaurant. The new regional headquarters of the National Park Service and the Gallup University training facility are located along the riverfront. There will be a network of biking and pedestrian trails. Ultimately, a pedestrian bridge will connect Omaha and Council Bluffs. The idea is the synergism of all that will just 
reinforce each other and with kind of almost the capstone of the pedestrian bridge being Omaha's new beacon to the world. Our challenge, if we really want the urban investments that we're making, and we're making millions and millions of dollars in urban environmental investments, is can we increase the number of unplanned positive encounters? Can we create that sort of serendipity, that sort of, of chance meeting, that discovery, that experience, um, and, and really make that, make that happen? It'll involve a kind of urban living that we often go on vacation for. We should have it here, though. And we should have it not just in the riverfront, not just downtown, but also in suburban neighborhoods, too. The cycles of progress versus historic preservation continue. Issues of preserving the city's recent past surfaced when the Indian Hills Theater closed. Despite a public outcry regarding the theater's significance, this icon of an era was demolished. Its site is now a parking lot. There was also a fight to save smaller historic buildings along Douglas Street. And one of those, the Christian Speck buildings, very small but very special. It's a very important building uh, to Nebraska, to the Midwest. In the initial planning and thinking on the Performing Arts Center, is apparently didn't even consider keeping these uh, resources and assets. That's the kind of thinking we, we hopefully can get beyond, where there's an inherent sensitivity to our existing attributes, and we work with them and keep them. Now, happily on that story, the, the story buildings are saving, the new ones going up, uh, they'll be a nice, uh, even contradiction to each other. That's what makes the city interesting. They can be compatible to each other, or contradict each other, but, but they give a vitality to the city, so it's not all homogenous and bland. The demolition of the old Swanson plant resulted in the accidental loss of Frankie Payne's home and business. However, despite his loss, even Payne remains enthusiastic about the future of downtown. I'm a downtown optimist. That's why I, <laughs> I want to stay downtown. I don't want to go anywhere. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's a great place to be. It's taken forever to get to the point, but anything good usually takes a long time, and this is very good. There's a lot of really neat things happening downtown. I believe that areas of cities go through life cycles. Uh, a period of early development, a later period of uh, middle age stability, and a period of old age. And as we look at downtown, we see some uh, renewal of those areas that had been in decline. And um, so we see a new life cycle beginning in these older areas of the city. I get goosebumps just thinking of everything. But again, one of the reasons I do that is because I remember when no one wanted any of that property down there. You could buy that for next to nothing uh, because you know that's all it was worth, if that. <laughs> And it's taken a lot of years to get to the point, you know, that we've been the last few years. But a lot of uh, exciting things have happened and are still happening. When we look back in history, the 1880s was such an important time in the city because it really heralded the beginning of a new future. It totally changed the look of what Omaha had been all about. Not only the look of the downtown skyline, but the economy and the people and the population and the growth that occurred. And when I consider the changes that have occurred in the latter part of the 20th century, uh, really from about the, the, the beginnings of the creation of the Central Park Mall, the Leahy Mall, and what has happened since that time with kind of a remaking of downtown, it seems to me as if the late 20th century the 1980s, the 1990s, and what we're experiencing downtown now is really remaking the look of what Omaha is going to be. And it is mind-boggling and eye-opening. When you drive up 10th Street now, there's kind of a new urban canyon almost with the, the magnitude of the convention center and arena facade. When you drive by that, it's just, wow, here's this big new statement and, and conviction of uh, what we can be as a city. And, 
exemplifying our, our pride and optimism. So my, my sense is that we're in a time here of, of really a, almost a watershed change for Omaha in what it looks like and the direction that it's going to be going in the future. An entirely new vision of, of what Omaha can become. Dramatic events continue to change the face of the city. But no one can really predict what Omaha will look like in another 50 years. In 1967, Jack Hawley wrote in an Omaha World Herald editorial, swiftly the city grows at its outer edges. Slowly it decays in the central city and cries out for rebuilding and renewal. But it remains one great urban community. And those who enjoy its advantages cannot for long escape becoming deeply enmeshed in its problems and in helping find solutions to them. Holly's comments remain valid today. The only certainty in any city is change. Dreams and plans quickly become current events and just as quickly become the past, forming the next pages in history. The patterns of decline and revitalization will continue, as will the cycle of how the people impact the city and how its residents shape Omaha. since World War II, the changing face of the city was made possible with major support from the City of Omaha and the Gilbert M. and Martha H. Hitchcock Foundation with additional support from the Allen and Marcia Bayer Family Charitable Trust, HDR Inc., Weissman Development, and the Architectural Foundation of Nebraska.